We are regularly asked as evolutionary biologists, what is the explanation for male nipples? And frankly, I love the question. Many- I will, I will just say that um, I, as a female evolutionary biologist, have been asked that question probably less than five times. Uh, and uh, you have been asked that question a lot, in part because you say like, you, you know, that you think about it and you have an idea and all this, but um, I do believe that this is more likely to be a question asked of well, a man with nipples. It's liable to be asked a lot of a man without nipples, but they don't exist, so mm -hmm. we can't test that hypothesis. It exists as a pure that thought experiment. That is not the alternative hypothesis, and you know it. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Um, all right, but let's uh, let us so let's just say uh, many, in fact, I think all evolutionary biologists have pondered this question at some point, and it's a wonderful one, which intersects very well with a concept. Uh, I don't want to drag people too deep into the weeds, but yes, you do. Decades ago, uh, I came up with an adaptive test, a test to see whether a particular feature of organisms should be presumed to be a product of adaptive evolution. Or not. And the reason I came up with that was not because this wasn't obvious, I thought it was obvious, but because there was a battle in evolutionary biology over the question of whether evolutionary biologists were leaping to conclusions, imagining that various features of organisms were the result of adaptation, when maybe, you know, there are lots of other evolutionary processes, could it perhaps be the result of drift or whatever. Um, so anyway, I came up with a test to free myself from that stupid question which disrupts everything if you let it get away from you and the test basically can you just uh, make a lot of arm gestures while you describe it you want me to do a lot of arm waving <laughs> like you should <laughs> okay um yeah. the test involves it's it's a conservative test it will miss some things that are actually the result of adaptive evolution and it is not a hundred percent conclusive it will lead you to the correct presumption if you apply the test correctly and it is conservative uh in a it's got a fail safe in it so the, it basically asks whether several characteristics can be found inside of a particular trait so let's say we're talking about the um i should have gotten a image for this but there is a an extinct reptile a, a uh, dinosaur epoch reptile called a polycosaur which has a sail on its back. This was a clade. There were lots of different polycosaurs. But anyway, Heather will bring up a picture of a polycosaur. So these animals had a sail on their back. We don't know what the sail was for because there are no polycosaurs that we can observe or you know bring to the laboratory or anything like that. So we are left with this structure and no ability to run a test in the present on what it does. So my point is, yeah, it's true that we don't know what it, what, what it does. One example of something it might do, it might be a solar panel that allows these animals to warm their blood by turning that sail towards the sun. But again, we can't observe them, so we don't know. But my point is that question, the mystery surrounding what the sail on the back of a polycosaur does, is not the same question as whether or not it is the product of adaptive evolution. Obviously, it's the product of adaptive evolution. And the test to show that this is the, the, the correct presumption is, does it involve high levels of complexity? Biology, adaptive evolution is the only process that creates high levels of complexity. So is this complex? Yes, there will have been a developmental pathway that has produced this polycosaur, a polycosaur sail. Um, you know, it has a structure, it has bones, it has skin, all of these things that we can still detect in the fossils. So it has complexity. It has an expense. It's made out of materials, right? Materials that could be redirected, materials and energy that could be redirected to something else that would enhance the fitness of the creature. And it persists over evolutionary time, right? Complex, it has an expense, and it persists over evolutionary time. And my point is, if it were not producing a benefit to that organism that exceeds that cost, then over evolutionary time, it would be eliminated, right? And we wouldn't see it. Instead, what we saw is a whole clade of organisms, different species that had these things, which says that some organism that had less of one uh, was not out competing those that had, had more of them. All right. So here's the reason that I like this nipple question. The nipple question passes the male nipple question 
passes the adaptive test, right? It's not hugely expensive, but it is an expense. Nipples are made out of material. That material does not have an obvious benefit in males, but there's a complexity to it. That material and energy that goes into producing a male nipple could be redirected into other fitness enhancing uh, behaviors or structures. And so what the hell is going on? Given that male nipples are not useful in the feeding of offspring, why would selection not have economized these things out of existence long ago? Now, here's the hypothesis, which I, uh, I have come to believe very strongly is likely to be true, but needs a test. The hypothesis is that if you have a mechanism, if you built into human beings or to uh, any uh, mammal. mammal, if you built in a mechanism any Ethereum. that would remove nipples when the male physiology program had been triggered, anytime something was going to be a male, you economized away the nipples, then what you've got is a mechanism that turns nipples off. Once you've got a mechanism that turns nipples off, A, it can go wrong. Occasionally, a female who is otherwise reproductively capable will lack nipples and her children will presumably starve. Um, and B, it creates a target for some, let's say, plant that you're eating to disrupt if it wants, if it sees you as a parasite and uh, is looking to reduce the level of parasitism. Can it disrupt that pathway now that that pathway exists? So the hypothesis is that the pathway is so dangerous where milk production is essential to the raising of offspring, that selection has built in a resistance to economizing it away so that no female is born without nipples and therefore those offspring don't starve for the lack of the ability to feed them uh, early in, in childhood. Now, again, this is a hypothesis. It, is not, it has not survived a test so far as I am aware. I will say... A valid scientific hypothesis requires a test. It at least needs to be testable in principle, hopefully in practice, but at least in principle to be a valid hypothesis, something like, let's say, oh, I don't know, string theory, which um, doesn't provide a mechanism for testing it, is not even, not only is it not a theory, it's not even a hypothesis, right? It becomes a hypothesis at which it makes a test. So. In this case, there may be better tests. I may come up with something more elegant and easier to accomplish. But I would say the correct test that I spot is if it is true that selection has actively protected nipples from being removed in males because of the danger that it would pose in uh, females to have such a pathway, then we will find that there is a protective mechanism. In other words, the degree to which different genes are exposed to experimentation, evolutionary experimentation, varies. There are some genes that are highly experimental because they're involved in arms races, and there are other genes that are very conservative because disrupting them creates a cascade of bad effects. I would argue that we will find that the genes involved in the production of nipples have been given a uh, that protective characteristic that prevents experimentation with their elimination developmentally, and that that is why we see them, right? And in fact, that would be the adaptive feature, right? The nipples would be a manifestation of that adaptation, which has moved nipples out of the experimental category into a highly conserved uh, category of the genome. Conserved. It's not. It's not exactly a question of low evolvability, um, but it's a. It's about. Um, and, a, and a sort of a separate kind of uh, conservatism around what could be changed. It's it's hard to operationalize them I mean, in part because we don't. Uh, there's so many possible mechanisms by which that might happen. But um, the prediction then that you are making for your hypothesis is that there will be something to be to be specified upon discovery um, that is uh, that is producing lower rates of change in those genes than in adjacent, other, otherwise comparable genes that do something else. Yeah, I wouldn't say adjacent because yeah. one of the things that happens is that genes get moved it. around the, the genome to protect them from experimentation. I would point out though, in thinking about this this morning, this is what I'm really arguing for is the inverse of what I have elsewhere called an explorer mode, right? Explorer modes are places where evolution looks around design space for solutions 
at a um, in a direct way. This is a place where such experimentation is reduced, um, and it creates a kind of uh, genetic sacredness or uh, some other kind. It creates a, a you know a taboo around genetic uh, experimentation. But in any case, that's the basic hypothesis.